officially on fire. <laughs> What's up guys? I am Jordan Arard Coupe here and now let's try and process everything that just went down. The Detroit Lions did a full house cleaning and the Jacksonville Jaguars started tidying up as well. The Denver Broncos legit had no quarterback. The Steelers and Ravens are now officially postponed until 2035. The 49ers don't have a home. Players are being placed on the COVID reserve list left and right. Wolf Fuller is suspended for six games. Uh, yeah, so... Because of all of this breaking news, I am actually going to be uploading two videos this week. My second video will be coming out sometime on Friday evening, and there I will be previewing all of the upcoming games for this weekend, which leaves us so much time for this entire episode episode to go over everything that just went happened in week 12. I don't even know where we are. I don't even think I know who I am anymore. I think we have to start with Raven Steelers considering I spent majority of my last video hyping this game up and um it still hasn't happened. We were supposed to see this rematch as our beautiful Thursday night Thanksgiving primetime football game, but then it got moved to Tuesday night, and then it got moved to Wednesday night, and now at the time that I am filming this video, literally, 10.54 on Tuesday morning. The game is currently scheduled for 3.40 p.m. on Wednesday. 3.40! Because apparently lighting that deformed tree in New York City is more important than this football game. Personally, I agree to disagree, but who cares about my feelings, right? Since week 11, when the Ravens played the Titans, there have been 21 people within that organization to have been placed on the COVID reserve list. The last update I read right before filming this video was that 19 people still remain on the list. That includes quarterback Lamar Jackson along with nine other starters. Some notable players on the Steelers took to social media to express their frustration with the Ravens for causing their game to get postponed. And then players on the Steelers started to get moved to the COVID reserve list as well, including running back James Conner. As I said, I took a very deep dive into this game in my week 11 video. So for all my takes and how I thought it was going to go, you guys can go check that out in that video. Because at this point, I really don't even know what to say about this game. Because let's be real, we don't even really know who's going to be on the field. Someone within the Steelers organization, a legitimate full-time employee, had their job duties changed so that they can sit and watch the Ravens' COVID reserve list so they can see who comes off of it and prepare for who they will potentially be playing against. I was so excited for this game, and now I'm convinced it's going to be one hot sloppy mess. And while this may put the Ravens at a slight advantage because the Steelers don't even really know what to expect. No, I'm sorry. I really can't even try and turn this into a positive situation for them. I wish I could. I said it last week and throughout all of these changes, I am still sticking with it. The Steelers are going to win this game if it is ever played. Now there are a lot of questions as to why this game got moved and moved and then moved again while the Broncos had to take on the Saints with a practice squad wide receiver as their quarterback. And there is actually a very valid reason for that game to have played out the way that it did. The NFL made it very clear that as long as there was no real outbreak within an organization, games would not be moved around. The Broncos had no outbreak. They had one positive test. The problem that then arose for them was their quarterback squad decided to go in on their off day to get some extra practice. Oh, that sounds so nice, right? Wrong! They were filmed, granted only for a very short period of time, but still they were caught on camera not wearing masks. This deemed them 
all high risk, therefore removing every quarterback from their roster and handing them a 31-3 loss on a gold platter from the Saints along with a bouquet of roses and a little note that read, be smarter next time. Drew Locke has since issued a very sincere apology for this slip up, but let's face it, if you actually read the NFL's COVID guidelines, there was nothing about that game, nothing about that situation that would have caused it to get postponed. One thing the league made very, very clear was they do not give a frickety frack if your team is at a disadvantage because of players on the COVID reserve list, especially if those players are choosing not to wear masks at practice. Postponing games and switching up the schedule is a last resort option. The Ravens, on the other hand, had 14 actual positive cases, which include both players and coaches. And those 14 positive positive cases mark a lot of other players into the high risk column, which I think can definitely be defined as an outbreak. So enough about how it wasn't fair for the Broncos. I do want to give some credit though to Kendall Hinton who was their practice squad wide receiver that got the promotion to be the franchise's starting quarterback overnight. After the league reportedly denied the team's request to start their offensive quality control coach at quarterback. Hinton's LinkedIn bio literally read, I am not lying, I am not making a joke. His LinkedIn bio said, and I quote, a current NFL free agent looking to kickstart a career in the medical sales industry. He was working in sales one month ago. My man's was looking for a whole other career and then just suddenly had to become the Broncos starting quarterback. He got the job because he played both quarterback and wide receiver for Wake Forest in college. And did he come out and shock the world and have the best game of his entire life? Absolutely not. But I still think he deserves endless credit for stepping up into the spotlight in the way that he did. He hasn't been tackled in two years. He had zero practice reps at quarterback. He was so grateful and so excited to just get out there and play. He said that was the most eventful 24 hours of his entire life. And at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. But now it's time to talk about some people that did not step up to the plate this season. The Lions have fired head coach Matt Patricia and general manager Bob Quinn after two straight seasons of being under 500 and now on their third consecutive season where we are creeping up on the very end here and well, they're still under 500. And oh my God, Lions fans, do you amaze me. After being entirely blown out by the Texans on Thanksgiving, the team legitimately not being able to put up one single point, the game that inevitably lost Matt Patricia his job. Lions fans began donating to Deshaun Watson's foundation to thank him for being the catalyst that got their mans fired. The Jacksonville Jaguars hopped on this bandwagon as well, firing Dave Caldwell, who has been their general manager since 2013. However, the team has only had one winning season under his reign. Also, I am just going to make a lovely graphic of all of the people who have been fired thus far this season while Adam Gase is still employed. Something I will never be able to wrap my head around. For now though, Jags head coach Doug Marone is spared while he still has his job for at least until the end of the season. And compared to the Broncos, they really have no room to complain about their quarterback situation, but they are still missing Gardner Minshew due to a thumb injury. We saw Jake Lewin for two weeks, and then we saw Mike Glennon. Now just listen to this roller coaster that led up to Mike Glennon starting in that game in week 12. In 2017, Glennon was benched in Chicago for Mitch Trubisky, who got benched this season for Nick Foles, who was benched last season for Gardner Minshew, who was replaced this season by Jake Luton due to his thumb injury, and now Luton was now just benched for Mike Glennon. I think I'm dizzy. And the Jags had a very close game this week, losing by only two points to the 8-3 and three Browns, but they still lost, and now they are 1-10. and 10. I also think it is absolutely hysterical that nobody is talking about the Browns. 
They are literally 8-3. and three. They are doing very well without one of their top guys in a season of stray insanity and not a single person is mentioning it. Do you think Baker Mayfield sleeps at night? Or does he just like lie awake and wonder why nobody is talking about him? He's probably laying in bed like, I guess I'm going to go have to film another commercial so people don't forget about me. <laughs> now, in some other interesting headlines... Can we just take a moment that I have like barely even talked about any games from this past week? This is all news that broke in the span of one week. Like what in the frickers? What's in the water these days? <laughs> okay, sorry. Other interesting headlines. The 49ers were left homeless this week after Santa Clara... Oh my god, why is this such a tongue twister? I've said this like 19 times. Santa Clara County. Santa Clara County. Santa Clara County. The 49ers were left homeless this week after Santa Clara County. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> the 49ers are homeless because Santa Clara County, where their stadium is located, banned all contact sports. Wow. The organization has come to an agreement with the league and with the Arizona Cardinals that allows the 49ers to play their Week 13 game against the Bills and their Week 14 game against the Washington football team in the Cardinals Stadium in Arizona. There is still no word on their home game that is scheduled for Week 17 against the Seattle Seahawks. 2020, man. Expect the unexpected. Especially for the Texans. Just as things were starting to come together for them. So let's just release Kenny Stills. Who needs him? Um, actually, you do. There was a lot of trade talk with Stills before this season even started that led up until right before the trade deadline, but nothing came of it. Then they just decided to let him go. Who does this benefit? No one. Not one single person. And as Justin Timberlake bravely said, what goes around comes around. And now your star, Will Fuller, has been suspended for six games, effectively ending his season for violating the league's performance enhancing drugs policy. And this could end his career in Houston entirely, considering that after this season, he's set to become a free agent. There are so many teams that have had it rough in 2020. Take it from me, I'm an Eagles fan, but for some reason, I think being a Texans fan probably hurts the most because all of the issues that you are having has come from within your organization. Even now with Bill O'Brien gone, you are still making Bill O'Brien mistakes. So we are just going to move past this and hope that 2021 is nicer to the Texans. Now let's have some game talk. I guess I have been pretty tough on some organizations today and I know I've been kind of avoiding the Eagles talk. So I guess let's just start there. Monday Night Football in Philadelphia against the Seattle Seahawks. Do we even have to talk about it? First off, let me just say that this was a very rough game. I mean, obviously it was rough because the Eagles are just an absolute dumpster fire right now. But I mean rough like physical and aggressive from both sides of the field. There was a lot of tension from the moment that game started. And from the looks of it, I thought it might help us out a little bit. But it didn't, so... We didn't even have a first down until there was less than four minutes remaining in the second quarter. Our defense stepped up huge to start off this game, holding the Seahawks to zero points on their first two drives. But when our offense can do absolutely nothing, it doesn't even really matter. It gave us such a real chance to get ahead and we just absolutely blew it. And if the announcers did not make it clear by reminding all of us every single time this man touched the ball, DK Metcalf was running all over us in Lincoln Financial Field, which just adds salt to the wound because we could have had him. We could have had him. But we took JJ Arcega Whiteside, who has 12 catches in his entire career, while DK Metcalf had 10 against us on Monday night.
Yeah, it really just is the best feeling. And while we're on the topic of draft picks, let's talk about how Jalen Hurts was hyped up so much this week to get more playing time, and he legitimately got two snaps. And let's face it, it's not like Wentz was doing well. Coaching staff said he's just not there yet. Hopefully he'll be back in another week or so. Seattle 17. Wentz, need four from the 15. Wentz throwing, and there's the interception. Our tight ends did step up big time, though. I'll give them that. Dallas Goddard was having an absolute time out there. He was like our only saving grace. And then Rodgers had an absolute glorious one-handed touchdown catch. Seconds, here's Wentz. Why not? Deep ball in the end zone, and it is... Caught! Caught! For the touchdown, Richard Rodgers! The ball in the old box score. Yeah, it looked like Fulgham went up. He had an opportunity to bring it down, and it ricocheted one-handed into Rodgers' belly. Wow. Now you... Yeah, that's a great catch. It's just how you draw it up. You have a jumper, a guy trailing it, a guy behind looking for tips as well. And for how beautiful it really was, I wish it meant something. Literally anything. But it happened when there was 12 seconds left in the game and there was really no chance of us winning at all at that point. It was like the saddest touchdown celebration you've ever seen because you could tell they were all like hype, but they knew the game was over anyway, so like nobody was really into it. <laughs> 33 yards. And for anyone that took the Seahawks minus six and a half, how badly did this moment right here following that touchdown hurt your soul? The NFL. So 14 on the season. And a lane opens up nicely for Miles Sanders. So, yeah, the Eagles are now in third place in the NFC East behind both the Giants and the Washington football team. The Giants did have a scare this weekend with Danny Dimes, but it seems like whatever injury he's dealing with, it's nothing serious and it's nothing to be too worried about. Now in the Panthers-Vikings game, I definitely didn't give the Vikings enough credit here. And after their loss to the Cowboys in week 11, I was genuinely happy for them. They've had a rough season. They were without their star Adam Thielen in this game. They deserved a Win. And while the Vikings came out victorious in this one, granted it was only because of a missed field goal, but hey, a win is a win. I need to talk about Panthers rookie Jeremy Chen, who had not one, but two fumble recoveries for touchdowns. Now that alone in one game is really freaking cool. Definitely something to run home and brag to mom about. But this man's made both of those plays on two consecutive Snaps. Cousin Chen on third down, lost the football. Panthers have it and will score. It's taken into the end zone by Jeremy Chin for his first NFL touchdown. Football play puts the Panthers in the lead. On first down, it's Cook. Jeremy Chin's uncle is the Hall of Fame safety, oh, oh, Steve Atwater. I, I, I think he stripped that. There's Chin again. They didn't blow the whistle. No whistle. They didn't blow the whistle. And Chin will celebrate. If no, that ball comes out. I just saw the ball come out. Jeremy Chin, he strips the ball. Yeah, the ball, ball was definitely out. Ball was 100% out. This has never happened in the history of football. Back-to-back -back plays. He gets the fumble recovery and returns it for touchdowns. That right there was literally my favorite part of this entire week. Like, it doesn't get any cooler than that. And the fact that he's a rookie just makes it that much more insane. Now, the Lions and the Broncos were not the only teams to get completely blown out in Week 12. The Dolphins versus the Jets, but this wasn't really a surprise, though. However, the Falcons beating the Raiders 43-6 to had me absolutely shook. The Falcons took the lead, and I was like, all right, but it's the Falcons. 
And Derek Carr has been having one of the most underrated seasons ever. And I know I personally don't give him enough credit, which is actually really bad of me. Because I said before the season ever started that he was the one on that team that had to step up. And he is. This week, they just started off slow making stupid mistakes and then they couldn't make up for it. And Josh Jacobs, who is having another stellar season, gave the team a scare when he appeared to be injured in the third quarter with an ankle injury after fumbling on a first and 10. However, there seems to be no real need for panic on this one. As of now, they're saying it is just a sprain. Depending on how he is feeling and depending on how cautious the organization wants to be, there is a chance he even plays this weekend against the Jets. The Jets who completely blew them out last year. That is going to be an interesting one for sure, but we are sticking with the good news here and luckily there is no major injury for Josh Jacobs. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to my channel so you can tune in later this week for my week 13 preview and picks. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and let me know in the comments down below which week 13 game you are most to see this weekend and I literally don't know if I'm going to have a voice after this one. Bye!